industry is to improve the outcome of joint replacement uh, surgery. And arthroplasty registers have three main aims, to have a quality assurance mechanism for ensuring and maintaining continual quality improvement, provide co community-based data, that's real-world data, rather than uh, data from specialised institutions, and also, most appropriately, establishing a mechanism for continuous monitoring of the outcomes. The Australian Orthopaedic Association National Joint Replacement Registry is readily uh, visible on the, on the web, either through the Australian Orthopaedic Association website or uh, just simply dialing it up on Google. Uh, it's owned and managed by the AOA. It's entirely funded by the federal government. Data collection was back in 1999 and complete coverage was started in mid-2002 as everyone came on board. There's over half a million hip and knee procedures uh, recorded and we're now starting with some other joints. It's voluntary and yet we have 100% participation from all surgeons and hospitals. There's 297 participating hospitals. Now the reason uh, it's voluntary is because we've tried to roll it out in a way that is non-confrontational and gives surgeons data which they can use without being threatening. So the data validation actually receives 96% of its data primarily recorded from hospitals. It's then checked against other data and with various matching processes uh, enables the registry to subsequently collect the remaining uh, 4%. There's a great deal of evidence that the Australian Registry has produced major change in arthroplasty practice in Australia and that's really important. Over the last four years, for instance, the proportion of hip procedures that are revisions has declined from almost 15% to just over 11% and the proportion of knee procedures that are revisions has uh, declined from 10.4% to 7.9%. And this uh, uh, reduction is primarily due to the reduction in early revision rates, specifically related to technique and practice as a result of the, the registry data. So it's uh, many fewer hip revisions per year and uh, almost as many fewer knee revisions per year and the cost saving is uh, $45 million a year, uh, which is an amazing amount of money simply from collecting data and letting the surgeons know what they're doing. In this year's report, we've analysed uh, almost 475,000 uh, hip and knee procedures uh, recorded by the register up to the end of last year, and that's an, a significant increase from the end of the uh, previous year. Now, I just want to go through some of the data. The, uh, I can't possibly go through all of the data in a lecture of uh, a relatively short time and uh, a lot of the data can be drilled down very directly onto a, an individual prosthetic performance, uh, which I won't talk very much about today, just primarily talking about some general principles of things that we found. But for instance, uh, if we look at uh, unipolar monoblock hip replacement, in other words, a standard uh, single uh, hemiarthroplasty for fractured neck of femur, uh, you can see that um, if the patient is uh, less than 75, uh, then uh, the results are very poor. If they're uh, um, between uh, 75 and 85, then the results are pretty average. But if the results are, uh, if the patients are over 85, then the results are really quite good. If we have a modular hip replacement, the results are barely better for the, for the younger patients, you can see here. Uh, but still quite good for the very elderly patients. But then if we look at the bipolar replacements, you can see that the graphs uh, come down. So really there's a very strong indication for using bipolar replacements uh, in the younger patients and perhaps there's, there's not terribly much difference in the older patients. We've uh, also noted that uh, and reported before that uh, cementless joint replacements uh, of this type do very badly and, and there's a significant reduction in the use of uh, Austin Moore type prostheses. In terms of primary conventional total hip replacement, uh, the results by fixation are relatively uh, straightforward to follow as well. You can see that the uh, cemented uh, hip replacement, uh, which is here, and the hybrid hip replacement, sorry, hybrid hip replacement is here, cemented hip replacement is here, and cement cementless hip replacement is here. And you can see that the cementless hip replacement is primarily as a result of early failures and then later on the graphs level out. 
If we look at, for instance, uh, fixation in the very old patients, then cementless prostheses do very badly, and the hybrid and cemented prostheses do relatively the same. So that age and fixation is interesting. Uh, the rates of revision when the patients are less than 55 is about equal for hybrid cemented and cementless prostheses. And in the age groups 55 through to 74, the best is hybrid and cemented is worst. And then over, the, over 75, the best replacements are cemented. And so it's probably related to the, uh, the uh, quality of the bone. But also there are some uh, differences uh, between males and females as well. Now if we look at the bearing surface, uh, there's also some differences we found. You know there's been quite a lot of interest, interest in ceramic on ceramic and metal on metal recently, and also ceramic on poly, uh, but the differences are worth noting. You can see that if the head size is less than 28 millimeters, then the differences are relatively few. Uh, they are, however, significant from this group uh, to this group, so metal on polyethylene is actually the best and then metal on metal is next best. And if we look at those figures in a slightly different way, we can see that the revisions per 100 observed years, slightly more for ceramic on ceramic, ceramic on poly, but metal on metal and metal on poly are about the same. This is for the smaller head sizes. If on the other hand we look at the head sizes greater than 28 millimeters, then you can see that metal on metal is here and ceramic on polyethylene is here. And so these are particularly bad, uh, whereas metal on polyethylene is here and uh, ceramic on ceramic is here. And so uh, these factors will, uh, if you know these, will then drive your choice of prostheses. So the other thing that's been of interest, of course, is the uh, uh, primary resurfacing total hip replacement, and Australia has been quite a big user of these. And you can see that... Uh, over eight years, uh, conventional hip replacements have a lower uh, revision rate than the uh, uh, Birmingham type of hip replacement. You can see that the curve here is quite steep, uh, then it tends to flatten out, but it's still worse, and these are the confidence intervals showing that it's uh, uh, statistically significant. If we look then at terms of the primary diagnosis, you'll see that if, you, if one has uh, developmental dysplasia, then the results are very bad indeed, so that 12 uh, out of 100 patients are revised at five years. And uh, this is uh, um, avascular necrosis, and then here is standard osteoarthritis. Still, as you can see, worse than conventional hip replacement. So it's pretty clear that one must choose uh, one's patients carefully if you're going to do this sort of uh, prosthesis. If, on the other hand, you're going to do them on females, they're going to do significantly worse. And you can see the results here. 8.7% revision at seven years compared with males. And then if you look at the size of the uh, femoral head, you can see that uh, uh, if the prostheses are less than 50 millimeters in size, either male here or female here, these patients are going to do worse. Whereas if the size of the head is more than 50 millimeters, then the patients will do better. So it's clear that patient selection, again, is, is very important if one's going to do this sort of uh, prosthesis. As a result of those, uh, of those uh, figures, the use of uh, this sort of prosthesis has been reduced quite significantly in Australia over the last three years. Um, and uh, although it's still popular for some patients and some surgeons, there's quite a bit of patient demand, uh, but surgeons are being somewhat more selective in how they use them. Then if we look at knee replacement, the, uh, there are some interesting, uh, interesting conclusions to, to bring to bear. The first one is an interesting concept of replacing the patella and trochlea uh, of the knee, knee joint. And these patients do particularly badly. You can see that at seven years, uh, the uh, cumulative percent revision is 24%. Um, you can also see that they do worse if they're male uh, rather than female and these are very poor results. As far, as far as primary unicompartmental knee replacement is concerned, uh, these results are also much poorer than total knee replacement. You can see that at eight years, the cumulative percent revision is 13%, uh, which is significantly worse. 
If you look at the age of the unit compartment, compartmental knee replacements, you can see that if, you, if you're young, that is less than 55. This is out to 18% at, f at eight years. And then these are in the older than 75% age group, but still they're about a 7% uh, uh, failure at, uh, at eight years. So it's a very significant age factor. One of the things that the registry can do is to drill down on, uh, on particular prostheses. And uh, here are a number of the prostheses that are performing. These are the standard prostheses, and you can see that these are significantly worse over relatively short periods of time. And one of the powers of the register in identifying prostheses that are coming quickly onto the market is that what can identify uh, a prosthesis like this that's doing badly right from the beginning. So even at one year, uh, you could say that it's, uh, uh, it's going to do poorly, and uh, these are regularly removed from the market early, but you can see that some people are, are still using these um, out at this, uh, this stage. And uh, we clearly try to encourage people to stop using them by discussing the matter in the register. The other thing that happens is that uh, in terms of the registry behavior, it also is in constant dialogue with the manufacturers. And the manufacturers ultimately, if their prosthesis falls out of a performance guideline, uh, outside the standard deviation, then uh, it will be asked to withdraw the product from the market. And if it doesn't withdraw the product from the market, it is then reported to other regulatory bodies throughout the world, uh, and it's seriously uh, uh, compromised in terms of its market position. So in terms of primary knee replacement, uh, you can see that at eight years, there's a 5% uh, cumulative uh, percent revision. And you can see again that if one's less than 55, it comes out to about 12%. But in the older, uh, older than 75% age group, it's a very good outcome at 2%. There's no difference between cementless, cemented, and hybrid fixation. But there is a difference between those that don't have a patella used and those that do have a patella used. And this is actually quite important. It's also different if uh, one uses a posterior stabilized knee as compared with a, a non-stabilized knee. And uh, there's a couple of other points to make. Fixed bearings do better. Antibiotic cement reduces the revision rate in total knee replacement, whereas it's not so clear in total hip replacement. And minor revisions of a total knee have a similar outcome as a major revision. So if one revises the patella, it's 12.5% revision at five years if one revises it with an insert at 16.5% at five years, and if one revises the insert only, then it's actually a very high revision rate at five years. But in, importantly, the revision, uh, re-revision of a unicompartmental knee replacement to a total knee replacement leads to a further revision 18% of the time at five years, whereas a total knee to a further total knee leads to a similar revision. In other words, this is a very major revision and should cloud one's judgment in terms of whether to do a unicompartmental knee replacement. Again, we uh, have identified, and throughout the document, which is more than 200 pages, which as I say, I can't really summarize here, we identify the poor performance of various prostheses. And you can see that this one's performing uh, poorly at uh, five years, having 7% uh, revision. This one's performing very poorly at seven years. And you can see that looking at the figures early, uh, that in general, you can identify these early, although interestingly, uh, this one was performing quite well uh, in its first year, but the figures just generally uh, continue to lead to uh, worse outcome. And so uh, with the process I talked about earlier, uh, we expect uh, uh, either the company to remove the product from the market or they in fact have their rebate and their capacity to charge patients removed from the market. So here, for instance, are some new knee replacements which have been identified even within the first couple of years a journey on journey, Columbus Columbus knee, uh, the Esca knee, and the OptiTrack PS. These are all performing very badly uh, in the early stages. And you can see that then they just simply uh, stop being used. And, uh, and that's uh, a very important outcome from the point of view of the uh, patient safety. So uh, this is a, a fairly brief summary of uh, of the uh, joint replacement uh, registry, and uh, I'd be very happy to uh, ask some questions about uh, answer some questions about uh, what we do. Thank you very much.